Hello, uh, once again, I forgot to charge my iPad, so I'm going to be presenting section 20.5 from the uh, Klein's Organic Chemistry second edition textbook here using the whiteboard and my camera phone. Uh, so 20.5 is oxygen nucleophiles. This is an acid catalyzed mechanism, which means we're gonna protonate in the first step, and then we're going to attack. Now we'll see how this PA mechanism gets modified quite a bit when we talk about the reactions of uh, aldehydes and ketones with alcohols and water and things like that. The mechanisms can be quite lengthy. Mo the ma vast majority of your mechanistic steps are gonna be protonation and deprotonation. So be very familiar with those types of uh, mechanisms. You should memorize these three uh, carbonyl containing compounds, formaldehyde on the top here, acetaldehyde here, and acetone, okay? We're going to introduce you to uh, three more functional groups. This is called a hydrate. That's in equilibrium with a, a ketone or an aldehyde and water. Okay, so water reacts with something to give you the hydrate. Hemiacetals uh, are when an alcohol reacts with a ketone, for example, an acid catalyst to give you the hemiacetal. Acetals um, are when two equivalents of an alcohol react with a ketone or an aldehyde to give you uh, the product here. Now these reactions are in equilibrium, okay? So if you add excess water, you can push the equilibrium. Excess alcohol, you can push the equilibrium. Um, so be familiar with hydrate, hemiacetal, and acetal. Speaking of equilibrium, when you take formaldehyde and you react that with water, in the presence of an acid catalyst, you form the hydrate of formaldehyde and the equilibrium lies vastly towards the right. So I'm gonna make this top arrow really dramatic. And so this is greater than 99.9% something, okay? So more than 99% of the uh, reaction mixture is going to exist as a hydrate, not free formaldehyde. Why, why is that? Well, in the previous lecture, we just discussed how formaldehyde was the most reactive, it's the least stabilized, it's really uh, electrophilic, okay? So water as a very poor nucleophile is going to attack that and convert that to the acetal. What about acetone here on the bottom? Acetone reacts with water as well. And yes, it's in equilibrium with the hydrate, okay? so. What do we want to draw for that? Well, instead of R groups, we want to draw methyl groups. And so this would be the hydrate of acetone. Acetone does not exist much like that. Most of it is going to exist as free acetone. We're only going to get about 1%, less than 1% of this equilibrium mixture is going to be the hydrate of acetone. Wait, why, why doesn't that occur? Well, we discussed acetone, it's more sterically hindered, so it's harder for uh, water to attack that, and it's also more uh, stabilized because those surrounding methyl groups donate electron density in and do not make that carbonyl as electrophilic, okay? The um, hydrogens, all on these surrounding methyl groups, are donating a small amount of electron density in satisfying the crave for that carbonyl for electron density, okay? So keep in mind that all of these are in equilibrium. You can go from the reaction from left to right or from right to left. So let me talk about the uh, acetal formation with, uh, I'm sorry, let me talk about the, the book does talk about the base catalyzed um, hydration reaction, but most of the time we're always doing this under acid, okay? So I'm gonna skip that from my lectures and I'm just gonna focus on mechanism 20.4, which is hydrate formation, okay? And I'm gonna do that for formaldehyde because aldehydes are the ones that are most likely going to form a hydrate, okay? So let's take, um, this guy here, I react it with water, 
acid catalyst to give you the hydrate, okay? Now what's the mechanism going to be? Well, as I mentioned, when you have acid catalyst, use that in the first step of your mechanism. By the way, on the right side of the board here, I have H+, which is listed as a catalyst, and there's a couple of catalysts you're going to encounter quite a bit in the Klein's Organic Chemistry textbook. You'll find, you'll find TSOH, which stands for paratoluene sulfonic acid, and that's the structure of that. You can see how it has a sulfonic acid group, or you might see H2SO4. Here's the Lewis structure of that. You can see how it has an acidic OH group. So that's an inorganic acid as a liquid form. This is an organic acid as a solid. I'm just gonna write H plus here in my mechanisms. So in our first step, we wanna protonate the carbonyl oxygen. Now that we have an activated oxygen atom, a neutral, very poor nucleophile like water can attack that. Oxygen has lone pairs. This will serve as our nucleophile, and we want to point those right to the carbonyl carbon like this, and this pi bond will break. Okay, not the sigma bond, just the pi bond, the double bond part of that. So that is going to form a molecule that looks like uh, this. Okay, so here's the water that we used to attack, and you can see how the oxygen now has a positive charge formally on that oxygen because it's given up electrons in this process, okay? So now that we have this intermediate, we need to deprotonate that extra hydrogen there from the water molecule, and we do that by more water, okay? So here's uh, the solvent, okay? Make a note for yourself as you're copying and making notes from this lecture. Uh, the solvent here is water. Sometimes it can be an alcohol, so you want to use whatever you have present. Don't always use water. Use methanol, use ethanol, it depends what's in there, okay? So here we are. That deprotonates. And I'll just draw a shorthanded bond line structure here. That forms the hydrate, okay? So first step is protonate, second step is a, uh, attack or addition, and then third step is deprotonate. So this is where you form uh, H3O plus, which is the same thing as H plus. So one small drop of H plus is all you need to convert gallons and gallons of formaldehyde and water to the hydrate, okay? So PAD for short. Might memorize the letters. Uh, you don't need to write the letters. You need to write the curved error reaction mechanisms that you might be asked about. Okay, we can do this for ordinary aldehydes as well. Let's do benzaldehyde. And I do recommend going through the curved arrows once a day for five days and then once a week to keep fresh. That's really the best way to memorize these sorts of things. As you're copying and writing these all down, try to rationalize or justify why does attack happen at this stage? Why doesn't it happen there? Why, why does it happen now? Think about things, okay, to deepen your understanding of what's going on here. So here's benzaldehyde. Uh, you may use that in a benzoin condensation lab, for example. It's found in almonds. Um, so there is benzaldehyde. So uh, we're gonna add water to that and it forms the hydrate, okay? Uh, so here is the, uh, you know, I, I won't highlight which, which atoms have come in here. I mean, yeah, I don't wanna use a colored pen, it's gonna mess up my board. So anyways, let's draw the mechanism for this. So uh, again, we have acid. So we wanna protonate that in the first step. And then we'll have protonated benzaldehyde. 
that's a very reactive electrophile, right? It's positively charged, but things are gonna attack this carbon atom. So we have present in solution water, and that's going to attack the carbonyl carbon. Electrons will be pushed up. So that's A for attack, and we'll form this guy here. It gets kind of busy with all of the oxygens and all the bonds and stuff, but, but here's the water that we've just added. Okay, here's water that's attacked a carbonyl carbon. And uh, we're pretty close. Now we just need to remove one of those hydrogens. So this is where we take the solvent, which is water in, in this reaction, and we uh, remove that hydrogen, and we form uh, that there. Now remember, this is at equilibrium, so don't be surprised if you know you have 75% of this and maybe 25% of that, okay? It all depends on what you're trying to do. You could try to push this equilibrium by using vast amounts of water, maybe change the reaction temperature as well, okay? So that's the mechanism. It's P, A, and then D, okay? I know in the beginning I said P, A, but there's always this deprotonation step that happens at the end, all right? So that's how hydrates can be formed from uh, formaldehyde, which definitely works. Aldehydes, which might work a little bit, but ketones, they really don't uh, form hydrates that readily, so I'm not gonna show a mechanism for that, okay? Next up, we have um, acetals, okay? Acetal formation. Now, as I mentioned, you can push this equilibrium all the way to completion by adding excess alcohol. It's hard to stop at the hemiacetal stage because generally what happens is you're using a large excess of alcohol, which just keeps on reacting, okay? To give you the full-on acetal, all right? So let me show you the mechanism for that and give you some examples. Now acetals and hemiacetals readily form from either aldehydes or ketones. Now yes, aldehydes will always be more reactive, but ketones readily participate in this reaction as well, because once again, you're driving this reaction with excess um, alcohol. So let me show you some examples of acetal and hemiacetals. As I mentioned, we're going to use excess, large excess of methanol to push this reaction to completion. We normally don't care about the single water molecule that's produced, but here for the first time since you're seeing it, I'll balance this chemical equation by writing H2O. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and show what the mechanism uh, looks like here. Okay. As you suspect, you're going to protonate in the first step because we have the H plus there. Okay. So we take our ketone, we protonate it, P for protonation, we form our very potent, very reactive electrophile. What's going to attack? In this case we have methanol that's present. So methanol has lone pairs on the oxygen atom, which cause it to be a nucleophile. We're gonna attack the carbon as usual. Electrons are gonna swoop up this way. When the oxygen attacks, it carries on a positive charge. So here's my 
methyl alcohol that has attacked, and there it is attached to our my molecule. And uh, now I need to remove this uh, hydrogen atom. What is present is methanol, that's my solvent, okay? So I'm gonna use methanol to deprotonate this. Now, this creature right here, we call a hemiacetal. Hemi means half, right? So we're halfway there. We have uh, one equivalent of alcohol, and we have the OH there as well. So they're not both methyl. Um, this is an OH, not an O-methyl, all right? So this is OCH3, and this is OH. So we're halfway there, that's the hemiacetal. So whenever you wanna draw the mechanism for the hemiacetal, it's three steps, it's P, a, D, just like we saw for the hydration reactions of aldehydes and formaldehydes. Okay, so I'll make a little note of here. The hemiacetal is three steps. Protonation, attack, deprotonation. All right, so this guy here is the hemiacetal. Now, we are trying to show the curved arrow reaction mechanism to show the uh, formation of the acetal. We start from here, you know, we continue on, okay? So what we're going to need to do is protonate this OH, all right? Now, could that methyl oxy group or the OCH3 group protonate? Yes, it could. All of these steps are in equilibrium, okay? So protons can explore many different oxygen atoms in a molecule, the one that's gonna lead us down the correct path to get us to the product is protonation of this oxygen atom. So let's protonate. I'm gonna use H plus once again, which is my catalyst. So that's a protonation step. So we have this protonated intermediate. Now water, remember, is a good leaving group. Here's water, okay? And that guy can just be part, giving you a carbocation. But we don't wanna show the carbocation because carbocations are notoriously unstable. What we wanna show is the resonance structure that would result if this oxygen lone pair would be involved. So we wanna make a little note to ourselves as we're studying and learning this for the uh, first time, always use your lone pairs. If you have a leaving group, and you have lone pairs next to that leaving group, always use the lone pairs of your heteroatom to assist with the departure of that leaving group, okay? So I'm gonna make a little note here. Always use the lone pairs. Please do not show a carbocation intermediate during this uh, reaction. So what we do is uh, we're kicking off water. Remember that's elimination. So we write E. Okay, so what do we form? We form this strange looking intermediate. Okay, it looks like this intermediate right here where we have a protonated ketone. We have a positive charge on the oxygen and there's a hydrogen here, right? So that's an activated electrophile. Same thing here, that's a super activated electrophile. That CH3 group looks really weird right now and if it causes you some discomfort, that's normal, okay? So we wanna use alcohol now to attack that carbonyl. So here's my solvent, my alcohol that's present in large excess, and that's going to engage, once again, the carbonyl. We call that a carbonyl, no matter what the nature of this thing is, okay? And that's going to attack So here's the alcohol that has just attacked, and here's the kind of alcohol remnants here attack, attached, all right? And you'll notice that there's a partial, you know, there's a positive charge on that oxygen atom. So we need to come in and deprotonate that with uh, the solvent, 
and the solvent that we're using is uh, ethanol. Okay, so the arrow points to that, and that gets me to the final product over there, which I'll just redraw here. So that's a deprotonation. So uh, to go from the hemiacetal all the way to the acetal, it's going to be protonation, elimination, attack, and then deprotonation. So that's PEAD, P-E-A-D, all right, P-E-A-D. So in total, there's a number of steps. It's PAD. Protonation, attack, deprotonation, protonation, elimination, attack, deprotonation. These letters are sometimes helpful, but I do suggest writing this mechanism once a day for five days and then once a week to stay fresh, uh, because chances are your professor might ask you this, you know, pr propose a mechanism for, you know, this sort of process, okay? It looks simple on paper, you know, we're just using methanol on that and getting that, but the details of it are quite um, challenging. Acetal formation is also in your textbook. This is mechanism 20.5. They protonate, attack, deprotonate, protonate, um, eliminate, attack, deprotonate. So it's exactly what I have here, okay? In the textbook, they do show you in gray, proton transfer, proton transfer, elimination, attack in gray, okay? So kind of be familiar with what's happening in each, in each step here, okay? So once again, we can uh, cause this reaction to proceed strongly towards products by using excess alcohol. It's very challenging to stop at just the uh, hemiacetal, okay? So this guy here is called the acetal. Okay. So three steps to the hemiacetal, seven total steps all the way to the um, hemiacetal, okay? Now, um, why do we have acetals? Well, they, they're, they're formed uh, when you have sugars, polysaccharides, and they're also used in synthesis uh, as protecting groups. So there's a variety of reasons why you might have this uh, in a molecule, okay? So this molecule here is cyclohexanone, and that reacts with ethylene glycol to give you a cyclic acetal. Because of entropic reasons, it's easier to form a ring than it is for two separate equivalents of alcohol to find their way into this molecule. So uh, the mechanism is exactly the same as I proposed earlier, and this carbonyl is no longer there. Now to deprotect this, so this is a uh, masked ketone. It's no longer a ketone, but this guy here can be revealed by adding excess water and H plus, okay? And it's just gonna have the reverse mechanism proceed onwards to give you the ketone, okay? So that's what's used as a protecting group. So for example, Show you what, what we're thinking of doing. I'm thinking of treating this with uh, sodium borohydride in methanol. Okay. And sodium borohydride will react with ketones and it will react with aldehydes. And what you'll form here is a secondary alcohol that's part of that ring and a, if I can do the right number of carbons, 
a primary alcohol that comes from the aldehyde being reduced with sodium borohydride. So what if I wanted to only reduce one of these? What would I do? Well, I can treat this with one, this one molecule, right? One mole of this molecule with one mole of ethylene glycolon acid. And which one of these functional groups is more reactive? This is where you go back to the trend in reactivity. Aldehydes are more reactive. So I'm not using excess ethylene glycol, I'm using a molar equivalent. And so what you're going to form here is a cyclic acid tau. And um, I'll leave the hydrogen off there. So this guy here now is a masked aldehyde, but we still have the ketone there. So if I treat this with sodium borohydride in the solvent methanol, this is going to convert my ketone to a secondary alcohol. Okay. And the acetal is going to remain unaffected. Now what I can do at this stage is add water with an acid catalyst, and that will deprotect the acetal and reveal it. form this uh, aldehyde that has a hydroxyl group present within it. Now there's no other way to do that. I could think, well, I'm just adding one equivalent of sodium borohydride to my molecule, and I want it to react here, not there. Well, how are you going to do that? Aldehydes are more reactive. Wouldn't your sodium borohydride prefer to react there? And how would you prevent it from reacting there? Ketones are very reactive towards a hydride. So the answer is to protect with this scheme here, do your reaction, and then deprotect. I know it's a few extra steps there, but this is very commonly used in organic chemistry to effect oxidation or reduction at only one of the two parts or three or four or five parts of an organic molecule that's polyfunctional. Okay? Now, uh, as I mentioned, you really can't stop at the hemiacetal stage. But there are some situations where uh, you do form hemiacetals, and those are when you have cyclic systems. So let's talk about the reaction of this guy here. We have um, an aldehyde and a tether. You know, there's a number of carbon atoms connecting this hydroxyl group. Okay, so is this molecule an alcohol? Is this an aldehyde? Yes, it's both. And so what can happen is that in the presence of acid, this guy can zip up. We don't have to add an equivalent of alcohol to this aldehyde. There's an alcohol already present. So probably what you're gonna do is already find this in the cyclic uh, acetal form. Okay. So here's your uh, acetal or hemiacetal carbon. Okay, this is the hemiacetal carbon. And it comes from the aldehyde, okay? So this alcohol comes around and will become bonded to it. So this is the alcohol now. And then the aldehyde carbonyl becomes this OH here, the acetal, the hemiacetal. So uh, this form is gonna be more stable because six-membered rings we've learned about are very stable, okay? So uh, the other thing uh, very commonly happens when you have sugars, okay? So what, what do they have in here? Glucose is an example in your Textbook. Uh, glucose.
glucose, <laughs> as with biochemistry and biologically important relevant molecules, can be extremely complicated. Glucose has a ton of hydroxyl groups here, and it does have an aldehyde, but I've circled the important reagents that you need to pay attention to. We've got this hydroxyl group here, and we've got this aldehyde group here. So when these connect, you're gonna form a six-membered ring. So here's a one, two, three, four, five, and then the oxygen is gonna be six, it's gonna be part of the six-membered ring. So you're gonna form something similar to that. They have a drawing of uh, the cyclic form of glucose in your book. Uh, it's a chair confirmation showing all the relevant uh, hydroxyl groups, okay? If you find uh, biochemistry and biology and things like that very interesting, you're gonna love when you, we get into talking about the different sugars and their forms and uh, oxidizing sugars, reducing sugars, and things like that. So if we look carefully on the very bottom right-hand corner here, we can see that that functional group or that carbon is part of a hemiacetal, okay? There's an oxygen, there's a carbon, and there's an OH bonded to the same carbon atom, okay? So that's the hemiacetal, all right? In uh, the book, they don't talk a lot about just predict the products. They talk about uh, drawing the mechanism, okay? Um, try problems 20.576267. Let me see if those are different than just drawing the mechanism again and again and again. Those would be in the end of the chapter. This chapter is very lengthy. Propose a mechanism. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, 26.2. Uh, mechanism 20.67 so what I think I'm emphasizing here is that don't just memorize that this is how you go from A to B here memorize how it happens try and remember the mechanism okay so let me do a few of these here um, I'm gonna do 20.9 a So we have acetone reacting with ethylene glycol to form this cyclic acetal. It's an acetal, but you see it's a ring, so that's why we call it cyclic. So we know it's gonna go through the pad peed mechanism. Okay, pad peed. So uh, let's get into it. Acetone, got some lone pairs, are gonna protonate. The protonated carbonyl is then going to react with your nucleophile. Where is the nucleophile? The alcohol is actually ethylene glycol. So what we do is we pick one of the oxygen atoms here and we attack. It's a weird looking uh, nucleophile, so it's great that we're looking at it here on the board. Okay, so it's got a positive charge there. We can't do much to avoid that. Uh, it's gonna be deprotonated. We can't use hydroxide or something like that. Again, this is acid catalyst. There's no OH minus or O negative anything in this acidic solution. So we're gonna use this solvent or this ethylene glycol here as our neutral base, okay? 
that's going to be propane. So that's PAD. All right. That's going to give me the hemiacetal. I'll be the first to admit that looks like a weird acetal, but that's the acetal carbon, hemiacetal carbon. We've got an OH and then an OR group, an OR group, right? So that's a hemiacetal. Let's continue onwards. So remember, we want to get rid of that OH. So this is where we need to propanate this. We want to kick off water. Here's water. Water is a good leaving group. So once again, like, you know, the E1, the SM1 mechanism, we always had water as a neutral leaving group. So here we have water as a neutral leaving group, but always use your lone pairs. Here's lone pairs. So we want to kick this off like so. Okay. And here's where it's probably better to redraw the molecule a little bit. Like that. It looks weird because it's kind of twisted around and it's, it's kind of more nicely drawn with the, with the oxygen of my OR group, right? kind of pointing up. So here we are. This is going to uh, cyclize. It's going to attack itself. So here's my alcohol that's going to attack at this stage. Almost there. Now I need to deprotonate that offending proton. So what's the solvent? What, what do I have in solution? You know, I have ethylene glycol, I guess, right? So that's what's going to be used to deprotonate here. And that will give me the very last step to give me my cyclic acetal. Okay? So First step is protonate the carbonyl oxygen. Second step is to attack the carbonyl oxygen with whatever crazy alcohol I have in there. All right, you get this weird thing with a positive charge. So now you deprotonate with whatever solvent alcohol you have, to give you the hemiacetal. Once you have the hemiacetal, you protonate the OH or the hydroxyl group. All right, now that you've situated water to be a good leaving group, it eliminates, but use your lone pair so you form that weird looking carbonyl compound and then you attack it, all right? If you're like this molecule here, you're gonna form the cycle now. So then to deprotonate that, you form the cyclic uh, acetal, okay? The rest is just very similar. You're just using maybe one equivalent, uh, two equivalents of ethanol or two equivalents of ethanol or methanol or something like that instead, okay? So, uh, 20.10 is predictive products. I guess we could do a couple of those. Most of your problems will not be predictive products for this type of question at the moment. Okay, so I just wanted to warn you about that. But this is 20.10. So in the first uh, reaction here, we have two equivalents, at least, of methanol. So what we're going to do is form the acetal, right? There, there's the key there. And it's not, you know, we're not doing anything cyclic, so for sure we're just going to go to the full-on complete end product, which is the acetal. Okay? Make sure you draw the ethyl group there, okay? So you're just replacing that carbonyl with two equivalents of methanol. Now, we're doing something similar here, but instead of uh, this just being a methyl group and this being a methyl group, uh, you have a tether, they're connected. So you're gonna form a cyclic 
cast a tail here. So, you know, here's your tether, right? We normally don't draw just like a curved line, like a rainbow or something. We need to sketch in one, two, three carbons. Okay, so let's do that nicely and neatly. So there are my three carbons, count, okay? That's a three atom tether. Here's my uh, three atoms. So that's what I'm going to form there, okay? For either of these two reactions, you should feel comfortable drawing the curved arrow reaction mechanism. That's it for this chapter. You should know how to draw the mechanism for the hydrates, the hemiacetals, the acetals, and know a little bit about the detail about which way the equilibrium can be pushed, which is more stable, um, things like that. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for more content from the uh, Klein's Organic Chemistry textbook.